welcome to the Political Trenches Local Government at Work. Our guest today is Alberta Senator Paula Simons. Senator Simons has been at the forefront of an important Senate inquiry into the role and place of municipalities in our Confederation. In December of 2021, Senator Simons launched a formal Senate inquiry to address the numerous challenges, opportunities, and constraints faced by Canada's municipalities, both large and small. Now, according to the Senator, our cities and towns are at the front lines of many critical issues, yet they are often lack the necessary funding and political power to effectively manage the responsibilities that have been increasingly downloaded upon them. This year, she, along with some of her Senate colleagues, have held a series of roundtable discussions to address the important issues facing our municipalities, including infrastructure funding, emergency preparedness, and social issues. With that, Senator, welcome to the show. Very happy to be here. So, Senator, I want to start off with a simple but a very complex question for you, and it's at the heart of what the inquiry is about. In your opinion, where do municipalities fit into our confederation today? Very uncomfortably. I mean, they are technically creatures of the provincial government. So, you know, if you think back, back to 1867, when, you know, the biggest cities in Canada were Toronto, Montreal, but they were tiny compared to what they are now. The premise was that cities are not included in the rubric of the Constitution, that they fall under the jurisdiction of provinces. The challenge we see is that, first of all, we have cities now that are larger in population than many of our provinces, and yet they have no commensurate power. So you've got a really big city like, you know, Metro Toronto, Metro Montreal, Metro Vancouver, uh, to a lesser extent, Calgary and Edmonton have a larger population than New Brunswick or Nova Scotia or Prince Edward Island or Newfoundland. And yet those small provinces have all the constitutional power that any province does while the cities are left dangling. The other problem is that cities are dealing with far more complex issues than they did in 1867. And even small municipalities are on the front lines of responding to everything from, uh, you know, emergencies created by climate change to uh, integration of new Canadians to dealing with all the hard work of reconciliation. And they just don't have the taxing powers, the resources to do that work. And as we can see, particularly those of us from Alberta can see that when uh, the federal government attempts to sort of catapult over the provincial layer to give resources more directly to municipalities, provinces tend to take that rather badly. So Senator, I'm, I'm going to ask, us, so before before yeah. I throw it over to Ian, I have one, again, simple question, but it's an uh, important one for myself. Senate, municipalities. There are two other levels of governments, two other uh, elected officials in between your role and the municipalities. Why was it important for yourself as a senator to look into this issue? Well, I think there are two parts to that question. One is that I was a journalist for 30 years before I joined the Senate, uh, much of that time as the city columnist for the Edmonton Journal. So I wrote a lot about municipal issues. I wasn't the city hall columnist. I was sort of the city at large columnist, but I wrote about planning. I wrote about zoning. I wrote about uh, infrastructure. I wrote about drainage. I wrote about all kinds of issues, you know, building arenas, all sorts of things. I guess I have to be nice about the arena now that it's about to host the Stanley Cup champions. But um, <laughs> it, it was so it was a beat I knew well. But I think the Senate has a unique position and capacity, especially now after uh, almost a decade of Senate reform, we have a very different Senate than we've ever had before. It is a nonpartisan independent body. The only partisan senators left are probably by the time people are listening to this, 12 conservatives. And the rest of us are independent and nonpartisan, not affiliated with a political party. And so we have a capacity to take the long view in a way that even the Senate before never had. And because we're not elected, because we're not beholden to and frankly accountable to voters, we can ask some tough questions that might get tricky for other people. And so I was really pleased that in my Senate inquiry, it we had senators from sort of across the political spectrum who took part from communities large and small, and we were able to have a discussion that was nonpartisan, non-ideological, 
and really thoughtful from a whole variety of perspectives. And so I think I think the Senate is the underappreciated, um, uh, you know, it's it's like a hidden treasure. And I'm really hoping that, you know, that this inquiry will be a model for future inquiries that other senators could hold in the future. Well, thanks, Senator. Um, you have also got a unique perspective in that you are looking across the country, whereas in the individual provinces, of course, they're looking inward as well, but only at the various provinces and territories. Are you seeing similar issues across the country, um, whether large and small, like you've made a reference to in terms of uh, metro areas or urban and rural um, topics that you're running into? Oh, absolutely. And this is, of course, one of the great strengths of the Senate is that we are a national body and it's part of our responsibility as senators to represent our regions. And so uh, of the 12 senators, uh, apart from myself, who took part in this inquiry, they came from right across the country, uh, from, you know, from small towns in Ontario that are, you know, from pre-Confederation to, uh, you know, I had a senator from Twillingate, Newfoundland, who took part, and one who comes from uh, the Acadian region of New Brunswick. And so they gave speeches in English and French. The other thing that was really special is that we have a number of former mayors in the Senate. So uh, inquiry speeches came from people such as Eric Forêt, who's the former mayor of Rimouski, Quebec, and uh, Bernadette Clément, who's the former mayor of Cornwall, Ontario. And we had uh, a speech from uh, Brent Cotter, who was the former uh, deputy minister of municipal affairs for the province of Saskatchewan. So we had people who had really expert knowledge. And then we had also people uh, who spoke from the heart and from their communities. And I should say, well, I was lucky to have another Albertan, uh, Karen Sorensen, who's the former mayor of Banff, who took a, a, an avid part of the inquiry and talked about the unique challenges of leading a municipality that is within a national park within a province. So, uh, so everyone's perspective was different and informed by the issues in his or her community, but there was a real common thread which was the frustration that municipalities feel when they can see the goal, they can see where they want to go, and they know, practically speaking, as the people doing the most frontline politics, what they need to get there, mm -hmm. but all kinds of levels of inertia and rice bowl guarding get in the way. Wow. Interesting that you would mention that we were we were aware of a couple of the presentations you had posted on YouTube, one about infrastructure, one about uh, social issues. Oh, so that, 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 that's different. I want to I want to explain. Okay. So oh, okay. the inquiry, a Senate inquiry is not like it's not like a public inquiry where, you know, you sit behind a big desk and you hear witnesses. So the way a Senate inquiry works is that you put an issue on the table and you invite other senators to speak to it. So I made a, a first speech sort of laying the table for this. And then 12 other senators spoke after me from their own regions. And all of those speeches, you can find them, uh, if you're interested, you can find them on my Senate YouTube channel, uh, Senator Paula Simons on YouTube. Um, and you can, you, can, you can find them in Hansard, but they're sort of, you know, nicely lined up uh, uh, on, my, on my channel. Uh, so you can you can watch some of these speeches, which are terrific speeches, uh, people speaking with such passion and such knowledge about their own communities. So that's that's the inquiry. And we're going to be taking those speeches and publishing them in both English and French. My office is working on a publication schedule right now. We uh, intend to have them ready, you know, ready to hand out uh, in September. So we will have a report which collates all of these speeches. Then after that, I was like, okay, not that many people watch Senate speeches. How can I also get this message out? So then I convened a series of three roundtable discussions, uh, which are also on the YouTube channel, and they are going to be turned into a podcast series. Uh, I, ho I host a regular podcast called Alberta Unbound. So this is sort of my summer spinoff. It's called Municipalities Unbound. And so they will, for anybody who subscribes to Alberta Unbound, you'll get this as your bonus feature uh, in sort of late July, early August. Good. Well, thanks. When it comes to the what you have found out or discovered, how much of it is structural versus the way municipalities are structured in the country rather than things that are cultural or behavioral? Well, it's hard to tease those apart because the structure is a function of the culture. 
and the culture is a function of the, is a function of the structure. So I mean, there are structural problems, but there are also real cultural problems, and there are, you know, issues of territoriality. I mean, for for people in Alberta, especially those uh, who are municipal leaders themselves, they will know full well that the Smith government has just tabled, a, you know, a series of bills in the legislature, uh, which would dramatically hamstring the ability of municipalities to work directly with the federal government. Uh, it'll be interesting to see when there's a change of government in Ottawa, as there inevitably will be, um, if the province will change its tune when there's a different federal government. But, you know, it's been a workaround that people have been utilizing for years now to have you know, infrastructure funds and revitalization funds and other things that the federal government has set up, particularly to do with housing uh, and, and LRT construction and that kind of thing, to get federal dollars to municipalities. But as long as the provinces are fighting with the federal government, as seems to have been the pattern since 1867, um, it's really difficult because the municipalities, you know, I think I had a line in one of my speeches that they're like the children sitting at the, you know, at the kids table at Christmas. And now mommy and daddy are fighting at the big table and the municipalities sitting at the kids table are like, Oh, mommy and daddy are fighting again. And all we really want is dinner. The, the Federation of Canadian Municipalities will be meeting this week, literally the day after this episode airs um, in Calgary for four days to talk about national advocacy that goes on in Ottawa. During your last few years since you launched this inquiry in 2021, meeting with stakeholders, I'm assuming, is probably a key priority for yourself and yes. even for your Senate colleagues. <laughs> Our confederation is is as diverse as the people in it. The the issues that are affecting Newfoundland and Labrador are not the issues that are affecting BC. And I I could tell you that from speaking to municipal leaders, you have probably heard a range. Are there any silver linings that you've heard over the last few years about what's going on municipally right now? You talk about how our municipalities are sort of squished right now at, at the top of the show. But is there any silver linings about what municipalities oh, yeah. are facing right now? Because I think, you know, it's when you're it's when you're stressed sometimes that you do your best work. Um, municipalities have had to be inventive. They've had to figure out workarounds. They've had to figure out how to best leverage their political and social capital. And I think municipalities have done some amazing things that maybe they wouldn't have had such creative responses if they'd had simpler, more linear solutions available to them. So, yeah, I mean, I think you can see all around the country um, cities innovating in different ways, whether that's in infill housing projects or, you know, that missing middle piece that people talk about so often, whether it's about um, uh, reconciliation. And I think you can look to Edmonton as an extraordinary example of you know, over the the times that, you know, from Stephen Mandel to Don Iveson to uh, Amarjeet Sohi, um, reconciliation in Edmonton has has come leaps and bounds in terms of building a community that is inclusive of, of Indigenous people. Uh, but I want to come back to something you said, Chris, about the problems being different. It's funny how much the problems are the same. One of the people who took part in our roundtable discussions uh, is the mayor of Moncton. Moncton, you may not know this, I did not know this, is the fastest growing city in Canada. It's having an extraordinary influx of immigrants, including Francophone immigrants from Sub-Saharan Africa, who are totally changing the makeup of the community. So, you know, you, we may not think of Moncton as a multicultural uh, hub, but it's really become one. And so there are things Moncton can learn from, you know, from Toronto from Vancouver. But you know, there are other communities. Brooks, Alberta is one of the most multicultural communities in the country. So the challenges that Brooks has faced, you know, Moncton can learn from them too. So the the other really common chord was the issue of climate change and the wear and tear on public infrastructure brought by climate change. 
and this is happening, whether, um, you know, whether you're the mayor of Norman Wells or uh, uh, a city councilor in uh, Bridgewater, Nova Scotia, right? I mean, all of, all of our communities, large and small, are facing extraordinary challenges relating to how we build infrastructure that is resilient, whether that's dikes in the Chinecto Isthmus or uh, you know, on, on the BC coast, or whether it's uh, flood mitigation measures in Calgary or dealing with the effects of forest fires. And so, yeah, I mean, that problem looks different in different places, but the root of the problem is the same. First off, name checking uh, the mayor of Bridgewater, Nova Scotia, David Mitchell, who watches the show. Yes. He's probably David Mitchell. Be happy David that. Mitchell was was on our first panel, and he was absolutely fantastic. So he talked about, <laughs> you know, the stresses on his community of hurricanes and other storms, and, you know, that's the same message that would resonate with people who remember the Calgary flood, or, uh, you know, we had on the mayor of. Uh, Gatineau on our French language discussion, which I I, uh, I leaned hard on my Senate colleague, Benedette Clément. My French is getting better all the time, but still not quite up to that. I mean, the mayor of Gatineau, I had no idea Gatineau had been hit by floods, by a, a tornado, and then by all the consequences of uh, the pandemic, border closures, and then the convoy. So, you know, uh, it was really interesting putting the mayor of Gatineau in the room uh, with the mayor of Bonneville, Alberta, talking about the challenges she's faced with wildfires and floods. So, you know, very different places, very different perspectives. But, you know, when you're underwater, everything looks very much the same. What's your hope for this inquiry? What's your what's the end goal? Are you hoping that? Right now, we're currently in 2024. As of recording this, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau is our Prime Minister. The Liberals are in power. Pierre Polyev is the official opposition leader. There's going to be a potential election in 2025. Are you hoping that something gets accomplished out of this inquiry in 2024? Or is this an ongoing endeavor to try to ensure that municipalities have a voice at that federal level? Yeah, I mean, I think I think as as befits me as a senator, I'm taking the long view. I miss sometimes being a daily newspaper columnist back in the glory days when the Edmonton Journal had a, you know, a 500,000 circulation. I could write a piece in the morning and 200,000 people would read it. And then the premier would say, you know what? She's right by gum. I'm going to change course. You know, every now and again, I had the perhaps deluded belief that I wrote a column and something happened, the mayor did something, the premier did something. Being a senator, it's a lot harder to see daily incremental wins. So you really, you know, my, my goal here was to start a conversation and to continue that conversation. First in the Senate, then in these roundtable discussions, then with the printed report to try to, and to have, you know, to talk to people like yourselves who are already in this space doing fantastic work because we need to fix these problems because people live in in municipalities they live in cities they live in towns they live in summer villages those are the politicians who are most in the crosshairs of public reactions to things uh and i mean sure we live in canada we live in our provinces but we live in our communities and you know, I think one of my other frustrations, you know, I mentioned at the outset that I had had been a journalist and had covered these issues for the Edmonton Journal. Well, at a time when daily newspapers across the country are in existential crisis and people are not getting local news anymore, I mean, it's pretty hard to figure out what's going on at your town council meeting if your community has lost its newspaper or functionally lost its newspaper. These are issues that are going to come back to bite people where they live, you know, if they don't do something about housing, if they don't do something about infrastructure, if they don't do something about their sewer pipes. Uh, this is not sexy stuff. You need reporters to go to city councils and town councils and cover these things. And then you need people to, to read and be interested in that information. 
And I'm worried that as newspapers are in dire straits, and as people are distracted by everything that they can read online that isn't about their communities, that somebody has to remind them that, you know, watching the latest news about Donald Trump's legal problems, while the schadenfreude may be a nice feeling, it doesn't do anything about your asphalt. You mentioned a couple of times a reference to uh, reconciliation and Indigenous government. A lot of times Indigenous governments are offering a very similar suite of services and programs that yeah. our structural municipal governments are. How have they been involved in the work that you've been up to? Well, that's a really good question. And it's it speaks to some of the complications of this. I didn't include a chief or a band council member in any of my panel discussions, although I did have Indigenous participants. They were, you know, more urban Indigenous. Um, you know, the mayor of Bonneville is Métis. I had Louis Cardinal, who's an Indigenous community leader from Edmonton, who's been really involved in reconciliation on. But I didn't have a chief because the relationship is so different. Um, they are working directly with the federal government. And then sort of tangentially with the provincial government, it's almost the obverse, right? So sometimes when they're frustrated with what they're getting from the federal government, they go to the province. You know, it's this same mummy daddy dynamic um, playing one parent off against the other. But indigenous communities are feeling very much the same stresses. Um, I was recently, I've asked a series of questions in the Senate recently and in committee about the crisis at the Little Red River Cree Nation in, in Northern Alberta, uh, where their community of Fox Lake was devastated by forest fire last year. And they've had a terrible time getting building supplies into the community because they rely on ice roads and ice bridges. And this year they were devastated first by the warm weather and then by the fact that BC Hydro kept literally opening the floodgates and flooding out their ice bridges. And as a result, the community is still in crisis and they've not been able to build nearly as much new housing as they had expected. And they've now declared a local state of emergency. So I've been in close contact with Chief Conroy Sukapakaham. Um, but, you know, it's really hard for him to communicate with Ottawa because Fox Lake is far away from Edmonton. It's far away from Ottawa. So, you know, the fact that they have to deal only with Ottawa and don't have recourse to dealing with provinces. As I say, it, it sort of flips the problem on its head. But, you know, but they're in a very different situation than, say, the Enoch First Nation, which has pretty much become integrated economically with Metro Edmonton in a way that would have seemed impossible 15 years ago. I mean, I remember um, the Enoch, for those who don't know the community, have an extremely successful resort and casino that is basically inside of Edmonton now. Edmonton has grown up around it. And when the Enoch first announced that they were going to build this casino, Mayor Bill Smith, who was then the mayor of Edmonton, was furious and said he wouldn't allow them to connect to city services. And I remember being at that city council meeting where the city's lawyer had to explain to the mayor very patiently in small words that that was illegal and that there was a you know a, a joint use agreement and if epcor pipes went out that far they had to be connected to the casino well now people in west edmonton wouldn't know what to do without that facility it's become a huge part of their lives and and you know and a way of integrating enoch into the larger metro but at the end of the day first nations have such a different governance structure that it um, you know, maybe uh, maybe I need to do a fourth panel at some point, maybe in the fall. Thanks. My last question for you, Senator, then. You have talked about the relationship between the federal and provincial governments and local governments as being an evolutionary one. What do you see on the horizon? <laughs> well, I mean, I think nothing, nothing focuses the mind quite like a crisis. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we have these sort of slow burning, we have the slow burning crisis of homelessness, which is different than the slow burning crisis of lack of affordable housing for, you know, people with, you know, working people with middle class incomes who also can't afford to buy houses. Uh, we have the slow burning crisis of, you know, the opiate epidemic and, you know, drug use on our streets. But we also have things that are coming for us 
related to climate change. And I think that I think people are going to be forced to act pragmatically, not because of the better angels of their nature, but because they're going to have very little other choice. Um, and, you know, it's interesting because we've talked a lot about my work on the municipalities inquiry. I'm also a member of the transport and communication committee, and we are just completing, we're just putting the finishing touches now on a study on transportation infrastructure and its resiliency in the face of climate change. And, you know, when you hear about something like the Chinecto Isthmus, which connects Nova Scotia to New Brunswick, and is in very real danger of sinking into the sea. And in the meantime, you know, the provinces of New Brunswick and Nova Scotia and the federal government are having this sort of, you know, fight over who should be paying for what. And you just want to say, stop it, fix this problem. The, the people of Canada who rely on the isthmus, and that's pretty much anybody who wants goods out of the port of Halifax, uh, we don't care which of you fixes it or whose jurisdiction it is. You just have to get it done. And, you know, my great fear is that we may actually have a calamity that is our wake-up call. I would like us to wake up just as we perceive the calamity on the horizon so we can do something to stop it. Thanks. In in your conversations with municipal leaders and even conversations that I've had and Ian's had working with municipalities across Canada, I get a sense that municipalities want to be heard, but no one's talking Absolutely. to them. No Absolutely. one's actually asking, sitting down with them. It's often, I, I'm often shocked when I get a response from municipal leaders to come on this show, to come on my other show, to say, yes, I'll come on. I want to talk about issues. In your conversations with municipal leaders, do you get a sense that people are just fed up with the partisanship? And I hate to ask the yeah. political question to end this here, but I'm going to, uh, Senator Simons. Do you oh, get a I sense think that, so. go ahead. Yeah. Because municipalities have to solve problems every day. Every day, they have to fix the thing. You know, if your garbage didn't get picked up, if your road, you know, has a sinkhole in it, right? They don't have time to sit around and have a philosophical discussion. They got to fix the thing. And so I can only imagine how frustrated they are when they see some of, you know, what happens in Ottawa where everything takes a long time. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I guess... To circle back to where we started, one of the things that started me down this road was at the beginning of the pandemic. I was stuck in my house in Edmonton and I felt so helpless. You know, the country was facing this extraordinary crisis and what was I doing? And at the time, there were no government MPs from Alberta. And so I started calling mayors all across the province the mayor of Grand Prairie, the mayor of Drayton Valley, the mayor of Innisfail, the mayor, you know, I, I called mayors up and down Alberta and said, you know, what are your challenges? What do you need? How could I help you to be heard? And in a lot of ways, I mean, some sometimes what came out of those phone calls was actually a practical solution to a problem. Uh, that was where I first spoke to Karen Sorensen, you know, the mayor of Banff and the mayor of Jasper, when I spoke to them said, we have a crisis, we have to pay federal rent to the federal government, and we don't have any income because we're vacation communities and nobody's coming on vacation. And so I, you know, I spoke to the ministry and I think I helped in a small way, at least to get them some, some relief on that rent. But in other cases, I think the mayors I spoke to were just so happy that somebody wanted to talk to them and hear them out and, you know, and offer to be um, a vessel for their ideas to get to Ottawa. Um, it was, it was something I did in that moment as much for myself, honestly, as as to be useful, just so that I could have a sense that I was doing something. Uh, but it kind of worked. And I think that was, you know, I hadn't thought about it till just now, but I think that's also one of the inspirations for this inquiry, was just talking to so many mayors who were solving the problems of the pandemic in their communities every day without, you know, time for ideological brouhaha they just had to get the job done 
Senator, I want to thank you so much from both Ian and myself for sitting down, taking time out of your busy schedule in Ottawa to sit down and do that, this this conversation and this interview, but also this inquiry. Municipalities are at a precipice right now, and as uh, they gather in, FC, uh, in Calgary for FCM, I can imagine this discussion that we just had is probably going to be on a lot of people's minds and a lot of people's conversations there. So thank you so much. I just want to take a moment and say the links to the three round tables, two in English, one in French are in the show notes the link to senator simons website which is the senate website and also the youtube channel is in the show notes as well so thank you so much for sitting down with us today thank you chris and thank you ian